Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, this webinar by Wu University. Um, this is going to be what you should know about neurotrophic keratitis, and we're very honored to have Dr. Simon Fung and Dr. Vivian Shibuyama with us tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're super excited to learn from you. I'm your host. I'm Dr. Elise Kramer. So Dr. Fung, thank you for being here. Um, Dr. Fung completed his medical training at the University of Oxford, followed by ophthalmology residency at the renowned Moorfields Eye Hospital in London, England, where he was appointed the 2013 and 14 chief resident. After a fellowship in adult cornea and external disease at Moorfields, Dr. Fung undertook an additional fellowship at the hospital for sick children in Toronto, Canada, the only institution that offers dedicated training in pediatric cornea and anterior eye diseases. Dr. Fung is therefore one of only a handful of ophthalmologists who has this kind of training experience in the world. In 2018, Dr. Fung joined the faculty as an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the Sinai Institute, David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles. He resides in both the pediatric ophthalmology and the cornea divisions. Dr. Fung is a medical educator, a clinical researcher, and a public speaker. He has been invited to multiple nation, national and international conferences to speak about his work and has won multiple awards. He is also the lead author of multiple peer-reviewed articles in high-impact medical journals and constantly strives for innovative solutions for his patients in practice. Dr. Fung is a member of both the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the European Society of Ophthalmology Young Ophthalmologist Committee and is the chair of the AAO YO International Subcommittee. Thank you so much, Dr. Fung, for being here once again. Now, Dr. Vivian Shibayama uh, completed her bachelor's degree at the University of California, Arvin, and graduated cum laude from Pennsylvania College of Optometry. She completed a specialty contact lens fellowship at Sinai Institute and stayed on staff taking over the direction of the specialty contact lens practice. Her practice consists of 90% custom contact lens fit to treat conditions such as keratoconus, corneal transplant, scars, ocular surface disease, post-refractive ectasia, and infantile aphakia. Thank you so much, Dr. Shibayama, for being here with us tonight as well. So all financial relationships have been mitigated. And with that, I'll ask the speakers to take it away. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kramer, for, and uh, for the wonderful and very detailed introduction, and uh, and thank you for the uh, program set, uh, programmer, uh, program um, directors, and also the set schedulers to you know, invite me to present today uh, about the uh, the sessions, which is you know what you what you should know about uh, neurotrophic keratitis. Uh, so. Um, Without further ado, we'll uh, talk about these things here. Uh, just uh, for the ways of, by the ways of uh, disclosures, uh, I have a research uh, support we see from Tom Pei, but uh, uh, it's not uh, relevant to what we have uh, mostly talk about today, although we'll talk about the medications. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, off-label medication use for the condition of neurotrophic keratitis. So first of all is what is neurotrophic keratitis? I think that's an important uh, question that we should first of all know about. Uh, I also want to move this away so you can don't have the black bar there. Um, so if you look at different uh, websites or textbooks or, or any source of information, you'll get different kind of definitions. And one of the ones that I picked up, first of all, is this one from the iWiki, which is an online uh, uh, resource portal that describes basically any conditions you can find in ophthalmology. And in there, uh, the neurotrophic keratitis is defined as a corneal degenerative disease characterized by reduction or absence of corneal sensitivity. And in the condition of uh, neurotrophic keratitis or NK, uh, corneal innervation by the trigeminal nerve is impaired. Now there's some issues with this definition because you're only looking at NK as a degenerative disease. As you heard, I look after both children and adults. And there are times when I see kids with NK, but certainly they're not degenerative. So uh, there are better uh, definitions out there and the one that I tend to adhere to is this one by uh, Professor Dua back, uh, in Nottingham, uh, UK, who uh, back in 2018 proposed that uh, uh, neurotrophic keratopathy, i.e. neurotrophic keratitis, being a disease that is a, uh, mostly characterized by impairment in the sensory and also trophic function of the nerves uh, and uh, with subsequent uh, corneal epithelial breakdown. And I think that probably encompasses all the things that we will see and also all the things that we'll discuss uh, this evening. 
just a little bit of background and uh, it's always interesting to look at the history of any kind of conditions and how they were discovered and I thought it would be useful to just have a think about how was neurotrophic keratopathy was initially discovered and it looks like it actually appears to be quite interesting so first of all it, uh, in 1820 uh, 22 uh, Herbert Mayo actually somebody from England uh, first of all looked at and realized that corneal anesthesia result, uh, can result after the trigeminal nerve uh, is uh, severed. And for those of you who are in the vicinity of Mayo Clinic, uh, this is the great uncle of the same person who then later on set up the Mayo Clinic uh, in, uh, in the Northeast. And then subsequently, it was also found that in a human case uh, in 1854 in Germany that uh, human can also have NK because of uh, a transgenital nerve uh, uh, um, uh, trauma or a dissection. Uh, and then subsequently later on, uh, the uh, Russell and Sladen, and this is the same person who, uh, to this day, we're still using the Sladen chart, is the same person that who developed the vision chart for us. Uh, in Sweden, they came up with the term keratitis neuroparalytica. Uh, and really, this really means the same thing as we talked about now, which is NK. One of the very interesting uh, experiments that they did on the rabbit was that they realized that the corneal changes can refer upon lid closure. And, you know, 150, 200 years down the line, we're still using tarsography to help us to treat uh, NK. So uh, a lot of things looking back in history teaches us a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the lessons that we're still healing today. Now, NK, uh, no matter how you look at it, NK is a rare condition uh, and in, in, in the past has been regarded as an orphan disease without very much interest for a very long time. So to see that tonight there are over 900 people, almost a thousand people signing in to listen to this talk is, is really wonderful. Uh, the prevalence is estimated somewhere between one to five uh, cases per 10,000 people. Uh, there's no really any information on incidents because it's so rare. Uh, but there are some estimates uh, available from various studies, as you can see uh, listed below. And it's somewhere between, again, uh, one to two cases per 10,000 to maybe a bit lower. Uh, it's important to notice that, uh, to note that in some conditions, such as the herpetic keratitis or softer keratitis, uh, the uh, proportion of patients who suffer from, uh, who suffer with NK is much higher compared to some other patients. And also, it is also important to note that even though the condition is rare, it could be very devastating. Uh, in one study uh, by Bat, uh, Bati and Patel, 50%, 15% of patients with NK needed the intervention of endotic membrane uh, to close the epithelial, uh, epithelial defect, and almost 40% of them uh, required tectonic keratoplasty uh, to help to treat the issues of corneal stromal uh, lysis, stromal perforations, etc. So even though it's rare, it's something that we definitely want to uh, uh, pay attention to. Now, we've uh, been harping about the trigeminal nerve, and so therefore, we are, I'm sure most of us will know that the trigeminal nerve is responsible uh, for uh, corneal sensation, and it's also intricately linked to the condition of NK. Um, I think it's important to realize that about only about 2% of all the nerves in the trigeminal ganglion is responsible for corneal innervation. And that may, be, that may explain why we don't see a lot more patients who have otherwise undergone neurosurgeries or other kind of trauma that hurt or damaged the trigeminal ganglion, but somehow was spared with corneal conditions. Uh, the pathway here, just to a quick reminder of uh, the trigeminal nerve pathway, the nerve itself starts in the pons. Uh, you can see the yellow uh, nerve on the um, picture uh, there. Uh, on the left-hand side, the nerve then projects anteriorly uh, and uh, forming the ganglion next to the uh, the carotid arteries. And then the ganglion divided into itself into three parts. The, the number one branch is the trigeminal nerve branch, uh, the ophthalmic branch or the trigeminal nerve. And that's the one that we are really mostly uh, interested in, uh, in neurotrophic keratopathy. The reason that we is useful to know about this pathway here is because anything that disrupts innovation to the cornea, either from all the way to the, nu uh, to the nucleus or just locally uh, near the, uh, the 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 eyeball or the, uh, the cornea, they can all result uh, in various degrees of uh, neurotrophic keratopathy. 
Now at the corneal limbus, when the nerve, uh, um, so where the nerves are entering into the cornea, uh, about 30 to 40 nerve bundles enter uh, the uh, cornea at the mid stromal level. And these uh, nerves advance from the periphery towards the corneal center, still staying in the same level. But as they advance, there are branches that turn 90 degrees anteriorly uh, and uh, advancing towards the corneal epithelial layer. Before they reach the, uh, the epithelium, they first of all form the Bowman layer, uh, Bo form a sub Bowman plexus. Uh, and oftentimes that's what we call a subbasal nerve plexus. Uh, and then the free nerve endings from that plexus then evolve uh, uh, and reach the epithelial layer. And on average, about 7,000 nerve endings exist per each millimeter square of our cornea. And that's why our cornea is extremely sensitive. Now let's just talk about some of the common etiologies. What are the uh, potential causes of uh, neurotrophic keratopathy? So some of them uh, are listed here, and the ones that are highlighted are the ones that are more commonly encountered, uh, not just in my practice, but also in a lot of my colleagues as well. And we already talked about herpetic already, uh, but it's useful to know that some of the systemic conditions or systemic uh, treatments diabetes, or as I already kind of mentioned, neurosurgery, uh, they can also affect uh, the eye as well. So uh, just having bearing, bearing that in mind will help you to identify that uh, patient of interest. Because I also see children as well as adults, some of the uh, rarer conditions uh, that exist in children uh, because of congenital or genetic inheritance uh, of uh, NK, I've also seen them as well. Uh, and the highlighted ones are the ones that I personally have come across. Now, the clinical presentation of uh, neurotrophic keratitis usually follow a progressive uh, sort of linear trend. The initial presentation may be just a red eye. Uh, and it's important to note that they have red eye, but a lack of distress. In some uh, people, especially in children who are developmental de delay, uh, they may ex uh, exhibit this uh, phenomenon, which is what we call ocular digital massage, where they uh, uh, really forcefully rub their eyes as if they try to stimulate uh, uh, their own eyes and try to feel their own eyes. The uh, stages then becomes uh, progressive, as I said. First of all, start with the central epitheliopathy, followed by a persistent defect, and then when these things are either happening for a long time or repeatedly over a long course of a, a long duration, then you can get corneal opacities, neovascularization, and then eventually stromolysis and stromal uh, per, um, thinning and corneal perforation. Now, the severity of NK is most uh, commonly staged with the Mackey's classification, and oftentimes this is what we use to base our treatment decisions on, although some changes are coming, and therefore I'm going to mention that also. So, uh, first of all, uh, in stage one, uh, these are the all the uh, all summary together, but to expand the, the font a little bit, I'm going to go into each stage in a little bit more detail. So, first of all, in stage one, this is mostly talking about just punctate staining. Uh, and um, you don't have any epithelial defect. You do have decreased here breakup time uh, and increased mucus uh, viscosity. But if you just look at the description here, uh, a, a sort of average person walking in saying they got dry eyes for a long time and may have had multiple treatments already and coming to a practice, uh, unless you kind of thought about NK, they may have been missed because many people have said that it's dry eyes and we didn't thought about uh, we didn't think about testing other uh, causes of the punctate epitheliopathy. So stage one oftentimes is a bit difficult to define and difficult to de detect. Now in stage two, there is an epithelial defect, so therefore it's much more striking. You'll usually uh, be able to notice it. And I found that the uh, epithelial defect typically is central and oval in shape. Um, it, even though in a textbook they talk about a rolled edge or road edges around the epithelial defect and so on and so forth. I find that in some situation that is not easy to find uh, and, and certainly not a sign that I'm sort of uh, relying on to diagnose uh, NK. Because of the uh, absence of epithelium, you'll get a stromal swelling and also a little bit of decimate fold underneath that too. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, again, because of the epithelial defect, you can also have a little bit of reactive, uh, reactivity within the AC, but we're not expecting some sort of big infiltrate uh, 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 if the NK is presenting on its own without infections. And then in stage three, this is where the uh, this is when the stroma itself is starting to uh, suffer, having either lysis or melting, uh, and uh, they can also get infections, etc. And if left untreated, they, they will become uh, uh, perforated at some point. So that would be the so the Mackey's classification stage one being punctate staining, stage two epithelial defect, and stage three stroma lysis. Now, some of the issues about the Mackey classification is that the very mild and very severe seem to be sort of very quickly summarized into one stage only. So uh, more recently, the uh, uh, American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons, ASCRS, uh, has uh, set up a neurotrophic keratitis study group, or NKSG, and they further define uh, the uh, uh, Mackey classification, and they developed this uh, even though it's up to six, but really it's a seventh stage uh, ASCRS uh, staging. Uh, and I try to put it on the table here so you can see that in stage one and stage two, they are subdivided into further stages to signify whether the stroma is involved, whether the stroma has any haze, uh, whether there were any scarring, etc. So uh, I think uh, it's very likely that the new uh, criteria is going to be adopted. Uh, mostly, mostly because it does provide an extra layer of information. Uh, but uh, looking at the current literature right now, I think the Mackey classification is still probably the one that we will rely on most of the time uh, to interpret our findings. Now, to diagnose NK, uh, I already mentioned that sometimes it's quite tricky, and therefore one really has to be suspicious uh, about almost everything. Uh, uh, especially when it comes to the history taking. So just before we talk about the symptoms that we talk, uh, uh, we listed here uh, on the bottom right is one of the uh, one of the children that I've met during my fellowship, where the uh, the patient has a skull base fracture uh, affecting the right side, including involving the trigeminal nerve. And as you can see, he is happy enough uh, to sit there to have a flashlight photograph taken uh, without any signs of distress. And, and really, this is. This is somewhat sort of troublesome or bothersome kind of image is what I want to kind of give uh, uh, want you to sort of remember. Uh, many of these patients will not have any sign of distress, and they could be very happily sitting there and feeling quite happy and saying that yeah, my eyes are dry and no one can work it out, but I don't know what the issue is. Uh, uh, and um, it's that striking difference between uh, the striking discordance between the symptoms and the sign that usually gives me the suspicion that something's not quite right, and I need to test test the sensation. Uh, looking at the symptoms, apart from being asymptomatic, which is the main theme, I think, I guess, tonight, um, they can have just general dryness uh, or uh, a lot more tearing. I think dryness, some people do volunteer, some people, they don't. Uh, they don't always talk about it. they feel dry. Remember that if they have lack of or reduced sensation, they may not actually feel the dryness at all. Um, they can have reduced vision independent of these uh, symptoms of dryness or lacrimation uh, because if their epithelial uh, surface is not so smooth anymore, uh, it will affect their vision. And again, disproportionate with science is really the key here. Now, past medical history, uh, we already kind of mentioned uh, uh, quite a lot already, talking about the systemic conditions uh, and also previous surgery to either to the eye or uh, within the uh, sort of newer surgery realm. And then when it comes to the examination, uh, I think, uh, first of all, I know that we are all you know, eye care professionals, so we look at the eye itself, but sometimes it's actually useful to sit back and take a look at the patient as well. Uh, looking at it and looking at and also examining the cranial nerves could be very helpful, particularly because many patients with trigeminal nerve uh, dysfunction can also have uh, concurrent facial nerve dysfunction or um, uh, the ocular, uh, sort of extraocular muscles involvement uh, because of the same uh, pathology or same procedure that affected their trigeminal nerve. So one of the things that I see a lot uh, in patients are those with trigeminal nerve uh, dysfunction oftentimes will have a concurrent facial nerve palsy. Uh, and uh, later on in the uh, subsequent presentation by Dr. Shibayama, we'll talk about two cases where uh, how it become a, a such a big challenge in managing these patients uh, when they have both the trigeminal and the facial nerve 
uh, paralysis. Uh, looking at the eye itself, uh, um, sometimes the eyes can be white. So unfortunately, white eye doesn't necessarily mean that they have normal sensation here. Uh, and um, looking at a slit lamp exam, we already talked about the MACI or the ASCRS classification. So those are the findings that you'll be trying to look uh, for. Uh, the key here is thinking and also performing the corneal sensation testing. It's very uh, common. And in, in, in fact, you know, some of my uh, um, trainees will do the same thing where one of the first things they reach and when they meet the patient is the poparicking with fluorescein. Uh, as, as soon as you put the chops in, you can't really test anything else afterwards. So uh, maybe it's a holding back on a poparicking, thinking about maybe just using the fluorescein strip uh, wet with uh, saline to check for fluorescein staining instead of using anesthetic, and then doing that testing. Now, the testing could be done with just a cotton whips, uh, which is, uh, I guess, many of, uh, of us are doing. Uh, if you want to be more precise, some people have talked about maybe a graded response to a dental floss. Uh, I personally do not have the Balmonte gas uh, esthesiometer. It's quite a cumbersome uh, equipment and I don't have the space for it, but I do have the kosher bonnet esthesiometer uh, on the bottom right, where it at least gives me some kind of quanti quantifiable data. And therefore over time, I can uh, track the uh, improvement or deterioration in one particular patient. Some of the investigations that we uh, in academic centers especially will think about considering uh, ordering our MRI of the brain in orbit if there were any suspicion of intracranial pathologies uh, and also confocal microscopy. I think in vivo confocal microscopy uh, really is a gold standard of visualizing these nerves within the cornea. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see one of the examples where in a normal patient, there are plenty of nerves. Uh, present in the uh, confocal image there uh, in the middle panel. And then in the lower one is what you see in a neurotrophic patient where the number and also the density of nerves are greatly reduced. Now that was uh, a bit of an overview about sort of the uh, prevalence, incidence and symptoms as well as very, uh, also the diagnostic criteria. Uh, now we're going to move on to the treatment side of things and, and I'm going to break it down into the conventional, the medical and the surgical treatment as well as the new treatments. So what are the conventional treatment and what are the aims of the conventional treatment? What well, the aim really uh, of the conventional treatment has always been these three uh, sort of three pillars. Number one is stabilizing the corneal epithelium so it won't be lost. Uh, to, to simple friction, for example. Uh, number two is to encourage the surface to heal because we know that in NK, the uh, overall uh, situation is that uh, is prone to damage and very hard to heal. And then finally is that to preserve sight, we really we, uh, want to prevent any stroma lysis and stroma loss because one that is, uh, once that is happening, uh, really you're on a slippery slope into either corneal transplant because it's uh, tectonically not stable or you might even risk perforations. And in here, I've listed some of the uh, uh, conventional options here, artificial tears, punctal plugs, contact lenses, either in the form, or, uh, mostly in the form of soft contact lenses here, uh, and uh, tassography, as well as uh, conjunctival uh, hooding. Now, on the left-hand side, the two pictures are the serum eye drops uh, and the amniotic membrane. They are, I would say, these days considered to be conventional as well, but they are actually more novel treatment than the, uh, the, the historical treatment because they seem to offer some growth factors. Uh, and uh, both the uh, serum eye drops and the uh, endotic membrane, because of the presence of the growth factors do promote healing and not just simply trying to stabilize the situation. Uh, they work slightly differently, but uh, I think uh, the evidence here is, is pretty robust now for the treatment of NK. Uh, first of all, looking at serum drops, you can see that these are uh, studies going back almost 20 years now, looking at the uh, efficacy of using serum drops in treating NK. And I think all in all, you can say that it's, it's, it's very useful. Uh, concentrations ranging from 20% to 50% have been used. Uh, and I typically start people on 20% first. And I've had one patient who gets so much relief that uh, the uh, NK pretty much completely disappear just because of a 20% four times a day serum eye drops. So uh, definitely have a role to play in the treatment of NK. 
Now for M delta membrane, I think this is a, a, a little bit harder to know. Uh, there are different types of M delta membrane now. And in these studies uh, are mostly uh, dealing with the old wet sheet membrane used during surgery to cover a persistent epithelial defect, whether it is uh, super helpful uh, in a chronic stage one uh, NK where you try everything else. Uh, and whether dry amino disc versus amino drops, I think I can't really necessarily give you the figures here. But certainly in patients who have a persistent defect, needing something to help to to uh, to with the corneal healing, uh, the amniotic membrane sheet here certainly have shown to be uh, useful in accelerating the healing process. Now, it's important to obviously with time look at some of the novel intervention. And one of the main things that we have achieved in the last 20 years is understanding the neural transmissions within the corneal nerves and also in the cornea uh, um, sort of ecosystem. And two of the key players in among all the different neural uh, transmitters uh, are substance P uh, and also the um, uh, nerve growth factors. I'm sure many of you will know about North growth factors. In fact, many of you may be using them already. Uh, it's useful just stepping, take a step back and know what, uh, how uh, North growth factors are, uh, how they work, and also how they classified and how were they discovered. So, uh, North growth factors is a family uh, is within the family of neurotrophins. is naturally found in tears and also as well as in the corneal nerves. And we believe that there's a uh, sort of a, a feedback loop where the uh, uh, intact corneal epithelium or healthy corneal epithelium, uh, they secrete nerve growth factors to nurture the corneal nerves. And in return, the corneal nerves uh, secrete substance P and other neurotransmitters to then maintain the corneal epithelial health. And this is it's this little uh, uh, very delicate cycle that keeps the whole surface uh, intact and also healthy. Now, NGF was first discovered in the 50s uh, by these two uh, Nobel laureates. Uh, and uh, on the left-hand side, actually, is a chick embryo showing the effect of nerve growing uh, around the embryo cell when you put a few drops uh, each day. Uh, and uh, because of the success of the drop uh, in growing nerves in vitro, uh, later on, it was used uh, in vivo uh, in uh, uh, patients with uh, NK. Now, this study is not uh, uh, data wrongly. It was dated back in 1998. In fact, this is one of the very few studies of ophthalmology that were published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. What this was, though, is that they were using murine or mouse NGF uh, in a treatment of persistent corneal ulcers in patients with NK. Uh, they treated in total 14 eyes of 12 patients, and practically everybody was recovering within a very short period of time, up to six weeks, uh, and uh, good visual recovery up to 12 months. But this was, as I said, murine NGF. It was not until basically 20 years later, uh, or almost 30 years later, that the uh, recombinant human form of NGF, which is synergimin, uh, that we are so familiar with now uh, that has been uh, available to us and also been uh, investigated. So uh, the Reparo trial was the first trial that looked at the effect uh, of uh, synergimin, and this was initially done in World High Center uh, outside the United States. Uh, it was a randomized control trial looking at patients with stage two and stage three, uh, MACI staging uh, NK. Uh, and as you can see in here, the pictures really show, uh, you know, worth a thousand words here. From baseline to week eight, there's a dramatic improvement uh, of the uh, the corneal surface. Uh, and uh, in total, there are 156 patients enrolled in this uh, study. Uh, um, and uh, at um, they were split into uh, receiving control and eye drops. And on the table on the left-hand side, you can see that 74% uh, uh, of those uh, either receiving 10 or 20 uh, micrograms per milliliter of uh, synergimin, uh, they heal compared to 30% or so uh, in the control group. So it's a great improvement compared to control. Later on, a similar uh, trial, a randomized control trial was uh, performed uh, in the United States, and this was the pivotal trial in 2020. And once again, you can see the uh, significantly more patients in the treatment arm uh, reach the primary endpoint uh, compared to the control group. 
And uh, uh, the difference is even more obvious when you look at uh, the graph number B, uh, which is the uh, when the investigators use a very stringent criteria of zero staining, uh, and uh, a great majority of patients heal because of this. Uh, and then synodrine became a uh, commercially available in January 2019. And since then, there have been a handful of aftermarket studies uh, reporting the real life uh, outcomes. Uh, and again, the results seem to be quite encouraging, even including in the, uh, the pediatric cohort. Now, there's some uh, uh, open questions still uh, to be answered about synergimin. Uh, firstly, because the uh, NK, as we mentioned, there are so many different kind of etiologies. Uh, we don't really currently have all the data or all the fine data about whether uh, synergimin is equally effective in different stages or different etiology uh, uh, of NK. We know that in general, it works, whether it's specific to one patient or one particular patient group with certain stages or pathology, we, we, we don't have that outcome just yet. Uh, secondly, the um, whether the uh, synergimin actually uh, uh, we grow the corneal innervation seems still somewhat unclear. Um, most, a lot of the studies that we, we talked about, uh, they are fairly short in terms of duration, up to about eight weeks of treatment and then monitor for 12, uh, 12 months. But they didn't really look into the corneal nerve characteristics. Sensation was tested, but confocal microscopy wasn't really performed to know whether the nerves actually regrew after the epithelial defect has healed. One more thing is that in the repairo study, actually, the corneal sensation did not significantly improve. So how does that therefore work then? We're not 100% sure yet. And, and finally, there may be other ocular side effects uh, or ocular effects of synergimin that after it, now that it's in the market, we're more likely to find out uh, what they are. Uh, so uh, in the bottom uh, right picture there, for example, is one of the uh, more recent report talking about synergimin somehow po uh, potentiate the formation of stromal vessels. Now, we didn't know about that. Uh, are there any other side effects that we're not sure about? Again, over time will uh, become more uh, obvious. I want to move on a little bit about the surgical treatment for uh, NK. And one of the exciting developments is uh, corne corneal neurotization. Uh, and uh, neurotization itself is, a, is an interesting word. Uh, how does it even come across? Uh, actually, neurotization is a fairly established technique in the neurosurgery, uh, neurosurgical world where they borrow or pinch nerve functions from a neighboring uh, uh, muscles or uh, area to supply a, an area that is of more important function. Uh, so in the two pictures here, you can see that uh, people have done uh, neurotization surgery for hand sensation nerves, uh, and also they've done uh, uh, neurotization for cross-face nerve graft where they can then activate a cheek muscle that was otherwise paralyzed because of facial nerve palsies. So because of these, what about the eye? Can the eye also undergo neurotization also? Well, uh, since the sort of the era of 20, uh, 2009, a number of studies have come up now. And I think looking at these studies could be a little bit confusing. The way to segregate them really is to look at uh, the two types of corneal neurotization, which is direct and indirect. The direct one is where you have a healthy nerve uh, that was completely transected, harvested, and moved into a different place. Whereas the indirect one, uh, uh, tend to we tend to use a nerve graph uh, from a uh, an area of the body that is doesn't really serve a hugely essential uh, function. Uh, the one that I personally particularly like to use is a sural nerve. Uh, the sural nerve is behind the leg, uh, and it only supplies a an area of uh, softy, uh, maybe like a, a quarter kind of area behind the uh, me, uh, the inner ankle, uh, just behind it, just for sensation reason. It doesn't control your running or walking or anything. And the whole purpose is just to feel that small area so that you, when you wear your socks, you know it's on. Uh, and uh, the nerve is great in distance. And therefore, a lot of times we'd like to use that nerve as a bridge to connect the eye to other functioning nerves without having to cut them or transect them. Now, uh, just a little history very quickly about uh, the direct neurotization. Uh, as I said, this was first uh, uh, developed in 2000, 2009 uh, by Julia Tursis, uh, where they borrowed from the other side of the forehead into uh, one of the uh, affected eyes. Uh, note that you cannot 
do this procedure in patients with bilateral NKs. It's only been one eye. And what they found after a great number of years of follow-up, uh, even though there were only six patients, is that some of, in some patients, the sensation seemed to improve uh, 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 with this uh, uh, new surgery. Now, uh, because the, the issue with this surgery, though, is that, as I said, it only treat one eye. But the other thing is that to actually harvest this, uh, these nerves in the forehead, at a time, endoscopic uh, equipment were not uh, available. And therefore, people have to uh, do a what we call bicoronal dissection. So the entire skin on the forehead has to be reflected over to access the nerves. Uh, and, and really, because of such a uh, um, such a big dissection plane is not attractive for anybody and uh, anybody to undergo or even to perform the surgery. So it didn't really gain any traction. Uh, subsequently, a, a form of indirect neurotization was then developed in Toronto. Uh, and I was very uh, fortunate to be uh, learning it from the uh, really the founders of this technique uh, when I was doing my fellowship uh, about five, six years ago. Uh, and as I said, what we did was we mostly like to use the sural nerve as a bridging graph and to connect connect the eyes that are uh, otherwise uh, anesthetized or neurotrophic to a functioning uh, nerve on, uh, or on or around the forehead. So these are some of the steps. So as I said, you first of all, half as a nerve behind the leg. You uh, Once you have that nerve graph, you go back to the forehead and identify a donor nerve. A donor nerve here acts as the area where we're going to eventually plug in the nerve and get the sensation growing into the eye. Once we've got that, uh, we uh, on picture H here, you can see we uh, dissect the serial nerve into a smaller caliber nerves because otherwise it's just too chunky and too big around to place around the cornea. And once we have it in the smaller chunks, then we place it around the corneal limbus uh, in the uh, subtenal and subconjunctival tunnel, and therefore everything is covered. And I think the important thing is everything had to be covered. Otherwise, uh, you may get like the romers or, or wrong nerve growing onto the surface. Once that's done, the other end of the nerve graph is then plugged or, or uh, we call it coapt, but really it's just like plugging into the donor nerve uh, and uh, let it grow into the new area. Um, this is a video, but because of the time, I think uh, it depends on whether we have the time to do it. Uh, we may want to play the video later on uh, to show you the exact steps, but really the, the 12 pictures I showed you have summarized this concepts already. It's always important to look at the outcome. So looking at the two uh, types of neurotization, uh, quite a great number of patients have on, uh, undergone the procedure in the literature. This is not just what I've done, but this is in the publications. Uh, you know, almost over 100 people have gone through uh, these procedures by various operators. Uh, and you can see that many of them uh, looking at uh, sensation improvement, uh, both forms of the neurotization can improve uh, 80 to 90% of the time. And in terms of vision, 60% of the time, it also improve uh, as well. And one of the things that in interests me the most is that uh, uh, if you look at the medial, uh, the median age uh, and the range, uh, as young as infant has been going uh, undergoing these procedures and seem to have good outcome with it. So that's very exciting for the pediatric setting as well as in adults. Uh, my small co uh, contribution in the in the realms of the in, uh, in the neurotization was that I performed the confocal and actually we can uh, confirm the presence of nerves after the surgery. Uh, and I think that's uh, really concrete proof that the nerves do grow back into the cornea. Uh, and later on using functional MRI, we can trace it back and showing that it's not the old one, it's the new nerves that we plugged in uh, that grew into the otherwise neurotrophic cornea. Now, we already talked about some of the effects of direct uh, neurotization, such as the uh, the fact that you have to do a fairly big dissection. Uh, and because of the big dissection of uh, across the forehead, uh, it's not unusual to expect, uh, it's not uh, surprising to expect that there may be issues with like hair loss, frontal nerve damage, etc. cetera. Uh, with uh, the indirect neurotization, uh, the side effects is much more minimal. As I said, uh, depends on which nerve you're harvesting to connect it. And when it's so small an area, like a small a quarter of an area behind the, the ankle, no one really pays a notice. Uh, I, I think one of the uh, useful things to realize is that after neurotization, one can then 
uh, and envisage to perform a corneal transplant later on to really improve the site. So I know that early on we say 60% has site improvement, but in the other 40%, if they have very lot of corneal scarring or corneal melting, et cetera, after the nerves are, uh, after the cornea is re-innovated, the nerves are established, you can then do the transplant to improve the site. And that's really, uh, a, a really a game changer. There are some uh, un uh, unanswered questions and because the technique is still new, so we still uh, need further studies. Uh, and I think over time, we'll see more and more of these cases being done. And certainly in UCLA, we have a very good experience. This is just one case that I, uh, our team has performed and followed for three years. And you can see that the, uh, even though the sensation may not have improved, the ocular surface has greatly improved uh, over the course of three years. Just to finally sum, sum up, uh, talking about some of the emerging therapies, this is really a run through of what is coming up in the market. Uh, we don't really have all the data, obviously. Uh, we talked about substance P being an important signaling uh, transmitter, and that actually has been used in the 90s and early 2000 uh, to try to use it to treat neurotrophic uh, cornea. So I wouldn't be surprised that it been sort of bring back uh, into sort of revival and to use it again. Um, similarly, you can see that in here, substance P need to be combined with insulin-like growth factor. And because of that, guess what? Recently, people are now starting to use insulin itself uh, to see if they can uh, treat neurotrophic uh, keratopathy. And this is something that is uh, fairly popular uh, in, in Europe now. It's like the hot topic and early results are quite encouraging. One can also look at maybe using some other molecule that's similar to nerve growth factors to try to treat neurotrophic uh, keratopathy. And these are just three different molecules being uh, being investigated right now. The sergulin, phenylalanine, and also ulanitrotac. Uh, the latter two have uh, ongoing clinical trials looking at the effects in NK uh, right now as we speak. Timeless in beta 4 has been going on, uh, been investigated for quite some time now, and I think the results from the clinical trial is pending. Uh, so uh, I think soon we'll see whether this molecule is useful or not. Uh, and uh, timeless in itself is a constituent of a platelet uh, and, uh, and neutrophils, and previously has shown uh, uh, to result in rapid healing of persistent epithelial defect. Uh, but again, we don't see what the uh, the true result is likely to be later on when this uh, clinical trial, which has already closed, a uh, final report is re results. Uh, and uh, one other one that uh, uh, sort of making the waves right now is the PRGF or uh, plasma rich in growth factors. Uh, is a very new concept. It's very popular again in Europe. Uh, seems to uh, the the. So, but the benefit over serum eye drops, even though it's similar, is that it seems to be uh, developed in a very strict pharmaceutical uh, environment, and therefore uh, things are more standardized, uh, and it contains a lot of different uh, factors. And again, a clinical trial is uh, being in physics and pending, and then hopefully we'll get to know about it soon. Uh, and one final thing actually is the matrix regenerating agent. Uh, this has been used for a little while now and is a basically a molecule uh, looking to see if it can uh, make the stroma and also the surface more uh, slightly stronger and also more uh, potentially healing, uh, uh, healing and uh, epithelial healing and growth and not so much corneal uh, lysis. And there's some encouraging results being uh, reported, but uh, I haven't seen it being taken off uh, recently in the United States. So maybe we won't see it being introduced. So this is just one summary slide showing sort of my current thinking about how uh, uh, neurotrophic keratopathy could be uh, managed from the point of being sus suspected to be assessed, to be classified and then to be treated. Uh, and um, there have been some uh, publications like a review articles, as well as a Delphi consensus uh, article on how uh, the globally the, um, the experts are treating this condition. So I think in conclusion uh, to say that is a neurotrophic keratopathy or NK is a challenging condition for any uh, eye care professional. Uh, but I think novel medical and surgical treatments are being introduced to the field right now. Uh, and I think uh, hopefully all these different treatment modalities uh, is going to make our job a lot easier in the future. Uh, one final plug is that I'm personally interested in a clinical trial looking at the effects of uh, synergimin. Uh, and uh, the corneal nerves and innovation using confocal microscopy. Uh, if you have a patient who might be interested 
in the study, uh, feel free to uh, drop me an email or find me any other ways. Uh, and I'll be happy to take any questions either later on or, or right after this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. That was a really great presentation. I'm lucky enough to witness some of the incredible outcomes of your surgery. So um, the next portion I want to talk about is um, scleral lenses and how we use scleral lenses to manage NK. And they are my favorite patients to fit because they don't feel anything. So I fit the lens like how I want it to be fit. And it's pretty straightforward. They're usually not complex. Um, most of it is just like the follow-up and making sure that um, they know how to care for their lens. And because they don't feel anything, you want to make sure that you follow them up very closely and catch things before they become a large problem. Really, every patient um, with neurotrophic keratitis... Um, should be wearing a scleral lens if they can manage it. Um, it's non-surgical, it's reversible, it offers ocular protection and hydration, and also gives most patients better vision um, than their spectacles. Bandage lenses can be used, but typically they dehydrate the cornea and they're not meant to be used long-term. There's been a few studies looking at the outcomes of scleral lens wear um, in ocular surface disease, and we know that it's a powerful tool um, to take care of these patients. Uh, the most significant cohort of NK patients was in 2017, the Mayo Clinic studied 47 eyes of 45 patients and found a significant improvement in visual acuity and quality of life with really minimal complications. So when I have an NK patient in my chair, um, my goal is to get the largest diameter in their eye to give them optimal ocular protection. There's usually, this is usually limited by a torsorophy. Um, we, we also use scleral lenses with therapeutics inside the bowl of the lens. Antibiotics can be used um, short term to heal um, persistent defects. We also sometimes use these lenses overnight um, to heal very persistent defects, but these patients really need to be followed every single day to make sure that it doesn't become an infection. Um, once these defects are healed, we switch them to serum tears inside the bowl of the lens, um, which is less toxic and it's much preferred for long-term use. Um, and I have not done this, but um, Observate can also be put so the wearing schedule of the patient is going to be full time, like the patient's going to wake up and put their lens on and they're going to wear their lens till the end of the day. At nighttime, you definitely need to discuss um, options with the patient. Um, I typically don't like ointments with scleral lens wear because it can cloud the lens. So I usually push the patients to explore more like the eye masks or the tapes to help them. Um, I have a couple of patients who actually wear their lenses 24 hours a day, which I know it's a bit controversial, um, but these patients, they have no lid closure. So they put a fresh lens on in the morning and then 12 hours later, they put a new lens on that has been soaking in peroxide all day. So, you know, they have a couple of patients, they, they do really well with it. You know, I watch them really closely and um, I'm watching for a new vascularization or, you know, any issues. And, and so far they've been doing really well. So um, that's an, a really, great way to use a scleral lens. Solutions, I'm not going to talk too much about, but basically uh, peroxide-based solutions are my favorite just because they clean well and they um, are tolerable for most patients. What you fill the lens with is important. Um, we used to have, you know, non-buffered salines, but now we have buffered salines. We also have neutrophil now, which is electrolyte enriched. And patients with ocular surface disease typically do better with either a, a pH balanced or electrolyte enriched um, saline. So complications in um, this population is going to be higher. Um, microbial keratitis is always a concern with any contact lens wear. And it actually hasn't been uh, frequently reported in literature with scleral lens wear, but it, it was present in a study looking at patients being treated for persistent epithelial defect, which emphasizes the importance of like, monitoring these patients every day when you're using these lenses to heal PEDs. Um, these patients are also at risk for corneal neovascularization, corneal edema, epithelial breakdown, and they're really prone to handling errors since they can't really feel when there's a problem with their lens. These are the patients that I typically see who come in with a bubble under their lens, or they have two lenses on top of each other, or they think that they have a lens stuck in their eye when really there's nothing there. Um, so I follow these patients really closely, usually like every, well, between Dr. Fung and I, like there's someone looking at them every one to three months, I would have to say, um, especially in the beginning. So, um, close watch and proper education, extremely important with this population. Um, so I want to talk about the cases, um, 
we, we've actually had a quite a few NK patients and, and they do really well with square lenses and I didn't really find them to be particularly interesting to talk about. But these particular patients that we're, I wanna talk about tonight are um, patients that have gone through uh, neurotization with Dr. Fung. And he was the first one to bring this procedure to UCLA. So like this, this patient was the first patient that I saw post-op. Um, she's a 28 year old female. She had a head, a head trauma, which led to facial palsy and NK. She was originally managed by our ocular plastics team with a partial tarsography and a lid weight. Um, she also had strabismus surgery to approve her alignment uh, and she was stable for a while, but she was really motivated um, to open her tarsorophy. So in 2018, she had her surgery um, with Dr. Fung. After surgery, she did develop some sensation and was able to feel like a breeze on her eye. And after surgery, you know, she never, uh, no EDs ever reappeared after surgery, but her tarsorophy was still in and she um, really wanted it removed. Um, and because the cornea was still really fragile and, you know, persistently staining, um, she was referred to me to have a scleral lens made before the tarsorophy could be opened. So um, on the first visit that I saw her, we um, basically just talked and, you know, discussed options. And there wasn't really any literature discussing scleral lens fitting over these nerves. So I, I didn't know, like, what, what did I need to do? Do I need to vault it, vault it like a bleb? Um, you know, luckily, cost, cost wasn't really an issue. So we decided to do iPrint Pro on this patient. We took an impression, um, we brought her back. We had to lice the tarsorophy the same day that we took the impression. She tolerated it extremely well. Um, and then when she came in to pick up her lens, she was 2030. So she was really, really thrilled um, by the vision. So if you look at the images here, you can see the nerve like running through the sclera. And you can also see the nerve um, in this OCT here um, where the lens is just lightly landing on the nerve. Um, let's see here. Um, so she is, um, it's, well, she's actually going to med school. I just saw her right before she left for school this year, and she's doing extremely well. Um, this photo is a picture actually one year later. I wasn't able to capture one recently, but the neurovasculation has minimized and her str stromal scar has really lightened and um, there hasn't been any new EDs. So she's doing really great and she's extremely reliant on her scleral lens. Um, so the second case I want to talk about is someone who didn't do as well. This is a, kind of a complex case. 80-year-old um, male, he had radiation for a squamous cell carcinoma. In 2019, he went through a course of Oxivate, but he continued to break down, and he was fit with a scleral lens in about, uh, I think it was like late 2020, and that lens gave him about 2150 vision, and he was really, really thrilled about it. Um, the issue with this patient was that he couldn't put the lens in himself. So he had a whole team coming in and one person would put the lens in, one person would take the lens out. And it was so inconsistent. And he would come into the office and he would have two lenses in his eye. Um, so he he eventually just broke down and, and failed um, in the scleral lens. So they they decided to just stop the lens wear and um, do a complete tarsorophy. And he had a complete tarsorophy for two months. So um, in February 2021, the lid was reopened and there was epithelial defects, in, you know, right before it was open. So um, they decided to think about enucleation and the patient was very resistant about that. So Dr. Fung came in, he did the surgery with the partial trisorophy and the ED amazingly did not reoccur, but he still had diffuse punctate staining. He was really determined to completely remove this, this trisorophy. So we decided to put him in a scleral lens, but this time I didn't, we didn't want to remove the trisorophy because was, his cornea was just so fragile. So um, we decided to just work with the diameter of the of the aperture and we fit him in a small diameter. And this time, you can't really see in this picture here, but the lens is landing right under the nerve, right on the conch. And um, the vision was hand motion at this point. And um, I just saw him two weeks ago, developed a cornea ulcer because the lens was in for three days. And yeah, he's not he's not doing so well. Because I think we're out of time, but I just, wanna, I just thought those two cases were really interesting. And um, I hope you enjoyed our talk. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much.